Chapter Sixteen, The Weary Search. Blakeney was not at his lodgings when Armand arrived there that evening. Nor did he return whilst a young man haunted the precincts of Saint Germain l'Auxerrois, and wandered along the quays hours and hours at a stretch, until he nearly dropped under the portico of a house, and realized that if he loitered longer, he might lose consciousness completely and be unable on the morrow to be of service to Jean. He dragged his weary footsteps back to his own lodgings on the heights of Montmartre. He had not found Percy. He had no news of Jean. It seemed as if hell itself could hold no worse tortures than this intolerable suspense. He threw himself down on the narrow palliasse, and tired nature asserting herself, at last fell into a heavy, dreamless torpor, like the sleep of a drunkard, deep but without the beneficent aid of rest. It was broad daylight when he awoke. The pale light of a damp, wintry morning filtered through the grimy panes of the window. Armand jumped out of bed, aching of limb but resolute of mind. There was no doubt that Percy had failed in discovering Jeanne's whereabouts, but where a mere friend had failed, a lover was more likely to succeed. The rough clothes which he had worn yesterday were the only ones he had. They would, of course, serve his purpose better than his own, which he had left at Blakeney's lodgings yesterday. In half an hour he was dressed, looking a fairly good imitation of a labourer out of work. He went to a humble eating house of which he knew, and there, having ordered some hot coffee with a hunk of bread, he set himself to think. It was quite a usual thing these days for relatives and friends of prisoners to go wandering about from prison to prison to find out where the loved ones happened to be detained. The prisons were over full just now. Convents, monasteries, and public institutions had all been requisitioned by the government for the housing of the hundreds of so-called traitors who had been arrested on the barest suspicion or at the mere denunciation of an evil wisher. There were the Abbe and the Luxembourg, the erstwhile convents of the Visitation and the Sacré Coeur, the cloister of the Oratorians, the Salpetriere and the Saint Lazare hospitals, and there was, of course, the Temple, and lastly, the Conciergerie to which those prisoners were brought whose trial would take place within the next few days, and whose condemnation was practically assured. Persons under arrest at some of the other prisons did sometimes come out of them alive, but the conciergerie was only the antechamber of the guillotine. Therefore Armand's idea was to visit the conciergerie first. The sooner he could reassure himself that Jeanne was not in immediate danger, the better he would be able to endure the agony of that heart-breaking search, that knocking at every door in the hope of finding his beloved. If Jeanne was not in the conciergerie, then there might be some hope that she was only being temporarily detained, and through Armand's excited brain there had already flashed the thought that mayhap the Committee of General Security would release her if he gave himself up. These thoughts, and the making of plans, fortified him mentally and physically. He even made a great effort to eat and drink, knowing that his bodily strength must endure if it was going to be of some service to Jeanne. He reached the Quai de l'Horloge soon after nine. The grim, irregular walls of the Châtelet and the House of Justice loomed from out the mantle of mist that lay on the river-banks. Armand skirted the square clock-tower, and passed through the monumental gateways of the House of Justice. He knew that his best way to the prison would be through the halls and corridors of the tribunal, to which the public had access whenever the court was sitting. The sittings began at ten, and already the usual crowd of idlers were assembling, men and women who apparently had no other occupation save to come day after day to this theatre of horrors and watch the different acts of the heart-rending dramas that were enacted here with a kind of awful monotony. Armand mingled with the crowd that stood about the courtyard, and anon moved slowly up the gigantic flight of stone steps, talking lightly on indifferent subjects. There was quite a goodly sprinkling of working men amongst this crowd, and Armand in his toil-stained clothes attracted no attention. Suddenly a word reached his ear, just a name, flippantly spoken by spiteful lips, and it changed the whole trend of his thoughts. Since he had risen that morning, he had thought of nothing but of Jeanne, and in connection with her, of Percy and his vain quest of her. Now that name, spoken by some one unknown, brought his mind back to more definite thoughts of his chief. Capet! The name, intended as an insult, but actually merely irrelevant, whereby the uncrowned little king of France was designated by the revolutionary party. Armand suddenly recollected that to-day was Sunday, the 19th of January, 
He had lost count of days and of dates lately, but the name Capet had brought everything back. The child in the temple, the conference in Blakeney's lodgings, the plans for the rescue of the boy, that was to take place to-day, Sunday the 19th. The Simon would be moving from the temple, at what hour Blakeney did not know, but it would be to-day, and he would be watching his opportunity. Now Armand understood everything. A great wave of bitterness swept over his soul. Percy had forgotten Jeanne. He was busy thinking of the child in the temple, and whilst Armand had been eating out his heart with anxiety, the scarlet Pimpernel, true only to his mission, and impatient of all sentiment that interfered with his schemes, had left Jeanne to pay with her life for the safety of the uncrowned king. But the bitterness did not last long. On the contrary, a kind of wild exultation took its place. If Percy had forgotten, then Armand could stand by Jeanne alone. It was better so. He would save the loved one. It was his duty and his right to work for her sake. Never for a moment did he doubt that he could save her, that his life would be readily accepted in exchange for hers. The crowd around him was moving up the monumental steps, and Armand went with the crowd. It lacked but a few minutes to ten now. Soon the court would begin to sit. In the olden days, when he was studying for the law, Armand had often wandered about at will along the corridors of the House of Justice. He knew exactly where the different prisons were situated about the buildings, and how to reach the courtyards where the prisoners took their daily exercise. To watch those aristos who were waiting trial and death taking their recreation in these courtyards had become one of the sights of Paris. Country cousins on a visit to the city were brought hither for entertainment. Tall iron gates stood between the public and the prisoners, and a row of sentinels guarded these gates. But if one was enterprising and eager to see, one could glue one's nose against the ironwork and watch the ci-devant aristocrats in threadbare clothes trying to cheat their horror of death by acting a farce of light-heartedness, which their wan faces and tear-dimmed eyes effectually belied. All this Armand knew, and on this he counted. For a little while he joined the crowd in the Salle des Pas Perdus, and wandered idly up and down the majestic colonnaded hall. He even at one time formed part of the throng that watched one of those quick tragedies that were enacted within the great chamber of the court. A number of prisoners brought in, in a batch. Hurried interrogations, interrupted answers, a quick indictment, monstrous in its flaring injustice, spoken by Fouquier d'Anville, the public prosecutor, and listened to in all seriousness by men who dared to call themselves judges of their fellows. The accused had walked down the Champs-Élysées without wearing a tricolour cockade. The other had invested some savings in an English industrial enterprise, yet another had sold public funds, causing them to depreciate rather suddenly in the market. Sometimes from one of these unfortunates led thus wantonly to butchery, there would come an excited protest, or from a woman screams of agonized entreaty. But these were quickly silenced by rough blows from the butt-ends of muskets, and condemnations, wholesale sentences of death were quickly passed amidst the cheers of the spectators, and the howls of derision from infamous jury and judge. Oh, the mockery of it all! The awful, the hideous ignominy, the blot of shame that would for ever sully the historic name of France! Armand, sickened with horror, could not bear more than a few minutes of this monstrous spectacle. The same fate might even now be awaiting Jeanne. Among the next batch of victims to the sacrilegious butchery, he might suddenly spy his beloved with her pale face and cheeks stained with her tears. He fled from the great chamber, keeping just a sufficiency of presence of mind to join a knot of idlers who were drifting leisurely towards the corridors. He followed in their wake, and soon found himself in the long Galerie des Prisonnières, along the flagstones of which two days ago de Batz had followed his guide towards the lodgings of Heron. On his left now were the arcades shut off from the courtyard beyond by heavy iron gates. Through the ironwork Armand caught sight of a number of women, walking or sitting in the courtyard. He heard a man next to him explaining to his friend that these were the female prisoners who would be brought to trial that day, and he felt that his heart must burst at the thought that mayhap Jeanne would be among them. He elbowed his way cautiously to the front rank. Soon he found himself beside a sentinel who, with a good-humoured jest, made way for him that he might watch the aristo. Armand leaned against the grating, and his every sense was concentrated in that sight. 
At first he could scarcely distinguish one woman from another amongst the crowd that thronged the courtyard, and the close ironwork hindered his view considerably. The women looked almost like phantoms in the grey, misty air, gliding slowly along with noiseless tread on the flagstones. Presently, however, his eyes, which mayhap were somewhat dim with tears, became more accustomed to the hazy grey light and the moving figures that looked so like shadows. He could distinguish isolated groups now, women and girls sitting together under the colonnaded arcades, some reading, others busy with trembling fingers, patching and darning a poor torn gown. Then there were others who were actually chatting and laughing together, and, oh, the pity of it, the pity and the shame! A few children, shrieking with delight, were playing hide-and-seek in and out amongst the columns. And between them all, in and out like the children at play, unseen yet familiar to all, the spectre of death, scythe and hourglass in hand, wandered majestic and sure. Armand's very soul was in his eyes. So far he had not yet caught sight of his beloved, and slowly, very slowly, a ray of hope was filtering through the darkness of his despair. The sentinel who had stood aside for him chaffed him for his intentness. "'Have you a sweetheart among these aristos, citizen?' he asked. "'You seem to be devouring them with your eyes.' Armand, with his rough clothes soiled with coal-dust, his face grimy and streaked with sweat, certainly looked to have but little in common with the ci-devant aristo who formed the hulk of the groups in the courtyard. He looked up. The soldier was regarding him with obvious amusement, and at sight of Armand's wild, anxious eyes he gave vent to a coarse jest. "'Have I made a shrewd guess, citizen?' he said. "'Is she among that lot?' "'I do not know where she is.' said Armand, almost involuntarily. "'Then why don't you find out?' queried the soldier. The man was not speaking altogether unkindly. Armand, devoured with the maddening desire to know, threw the last fragment of prudence to the wind. He assumed a more careless air, trying to look as like a country bumpkin in love as he could. "'I would like to find out,' he said, "'but I don't know where to inquire. My sweetheart has certainly left her home,' he added lightly, some say that she has been false to me, but I think that, mayhap, she has been arrested. "'Well, then, you Gabi,' said the soldier good-humouredly, "'go straight to La Tournelle. You know where it is?' Armand knew well enough, but thought it more prudent to keep up the air of the ignorant lout. "'Straight down that first corridor on your right,' explained the other, pointing in the direction which he had indicated. "'You will find the guichet of La Tournelle exactly opposite you.' Ask the concierge for the register of female prisoners. Every free-born citizen of the Republic has the right to inspect prison registers. It is a new decree framed for safeguarding the liberty of the people. But if you do not press half a livre in the hand of the concierge, he added, speaking confidentially, you will find that the register will not be quite ready for your inspection. Half a livre? exclaimed Armand, striving to play his part to the end. How can a poor devil of a labourer have half a livre to give away? Well, a few sous will do in that case. A few sous will always welcome these hard times. Armand took the hint, and as the crowd had drifted away momentarily to a further position of the corridor, he contrived to press a few copper coins into the hand of the obliging soldier. Of course he knew his way to La Tournelle, and he would have covered the distance that separated him from the guichet there, with steps flying like the wind. But, commending himself for his own prudence, he walked as slowly as he could along the interminable corridor, past the several minor courts of justice, and skirting the courtyard where the male prisoners took their exercise. At last, having struck sharply to his left and ascended a short flight of stairs, he found himself in front of the guichet, a narrow wooden box, wherein the clerk in charge of the prison registers sat nominally at the disposal of the citizens of this free republic. But to Armand's almost overwhelming chagrin, he found the place entirely deserted. The guichet was closed down. There was not a soul in sight. The disappointment was doubly keen, coming as it did in the wake of hope that had refused to be gainsaid. Armand himself did not realise how sanguine he had been, until he discovered that he must wait, and wait again, wait for hours, all day mayhap, before he could get definite news of Jeanne. He wandered aimlessly in the vicinity of that silent, deserted, cruel spot, where a closed trap-door seemed to shut off all his hopes of a speedy sight of Jeanne. 
He inquired of the first sentinels whom he came across at what hour the clerk of the registers would be back at his post. The shoulders shrugged their shoulders and could give no information. Then began Armand's aimless wanderings around La Tournelle, his fruitless inquiries, his wild, excited search for the hide-bound official who was keeping him from the knowledge of Jeanne. He went back to his sentinel well-wisher by the women's courtyard, but found neither consolation nor encouragement there. "'It is not the hour, quoi,' the soldier remarked with laconic philosophy. It apparently was not the hour when the prison registers were placed at the disposal of the public. After much fruitless inquiry, Armand at last was informed by a bon bourgeois, who was wandering about the House of Justice, and who seemed to know its multifarious rules, that the prison registers all over Paris could only be consulted by the public between the hours of six and seven in the evening. There was nothing for it but to wait. Armand, whose temples were throbbing, who was footsore, hungry, and wretched, could gain nothing by continuing his aimless wanderings through the labyrinthine building. For close upon another hour he stood with his face glued against the ironwork which separated him from the female prisoner's courtyard. Once it seemed to him, as if from its further end, he caught the sound of that exquisitely melodious voice which had rung for ever in his ear since that memorable evening when Jeanne's dainty footsteps had first crossed the path of his destiny. He strained his eyes to look in the direction whence the voice had come, but the centre of the courtyard was planted with a small garden of shrubs and Armand could not see across it. At last, driven forth like a wandering and lost soul, he turned back and out into the streets. The air was mild and damp. The sharp thaw had persisted through the day, and a thin, misty rain was falling and converting the ill-paved roads into seas of mud. But of this Armand was wholly unconscious. He walked along the quay, holding his cap in his hand, so that the mild south wind should cool his burning forehead. How he contrived to kill those long, weary hours he could not afterwards have said. Once he felt very hungry, and turned almost mechanically into an eating-house, and tried to eat and drink. But most of the day he wandered through the streets, restlessly, unceasingly, feeling neither chill nor fatigue. The hour before six o'clock found him on the Quai de l'Horloge, in the shadow of the great towers of the Hall of Justice, listening for the clang of the clock that would sound the hour of his deliverance from this agonizing torture of suspense. He found his way to La Tournelle without any hesitation. There before him was the wooden box, with its guichet open at last, and two stands upon its ledge, on which were placed two huge leather-bound books. Though Armand was nearly an hour before the appointed time, he saw when he arrived a number of people standing round the guichet. Two soldiers were there keeping guard and forcing the patient, long-suffering inquirers to stand in a queue, each waiting his or her turn at the books. It was a curious crowd that stood there, in single file, as if waiting at the door of the cheaper part of a theatre, men in substantial cloth clothes, and others in ragged blouse and breeches. There were a few women, too, with black shawls on their shoulders and kerchiefs round their wan, tear-stained faces. They were all silent and absorbed submissive under the rough handling of the soldiery, humble and deferential, when anon the clerk of the registers entered his box, and prepared to place those fateful books at the disposal of those who had lost a loved one, father, brother, mother, or wife, and who had come to search through those cruel pages. From inside his box the clerk disputed every inquirer's right to consult the books. He made as many difficulties as he could, demanding the production of certificates of safety or permits from the section. He was as insolent as he dared, and Armand, from where he stood, could see that a continuous, if somewhat thin, stream of coppers flowed from the hands of the inquirers into those of the official. It was quite dark in the passage, where the long queue continued to swell with amazing rapidity. Only on the ledge in front of the guichet there was a guttering tallow candle at the disposal of the inquirers. Now it was Armand's turn at last. By this time his heart was beating so strongly and so rapidly that he could not have trusted himself to speak. He fumbled in his pocket, and without unnecessary preliminaries he produced a small piece of silver and pushed it towards the clerk. Then he seized on the register marked Femme, with voracious avidity. The clerk had, with stolid indifference, pocketed the half-livre. He looked on Armand over a pair of large, bone-rimmed spectacles, with the air of an old hawk that sees a helpless bird, and yet is too satiated to eat. 
He was apparently vastly amused at Armand's trembling hands, and the clumsy, aimless way with which he fingered the book and held up the tallow candle. "'What date?' he asked curtly in a piping voice. "'What date?' reiterated Armand vaguely. "'What day and hour was she arrested?' said the man, thrusting his beak-like nose closer to Armand's face. Evidently the piece of silver had done its work well. He meant to be helpful to this country lout. "'On Friday evening,' murmured the young man. The clerk's hands did not in character gainsay the rest of his appearance. They were long and thin, with nails that resembled the talons of a hawk. Armand watched them fascinated as from above they turned over rapidly the pages of the book. Then one long, grimy finger pointed to a row of names down a column. "'If she is here,' said the man curtly, "'her name should be amongst these.' Armand's vision was blurred. He could scarcely see. The row of names was dancing a wild dance in front of his eyes. Perspiration stood out on his forehead, and his breath came in quick, stertorous gasps. He never knew afterwards whether he actually saw Jeanne's name there in the book, or whether his fevered brain was playing his aching senses a cruel and mocking trick. Certain it is that suddenly, amongst a row of indifferent names, hers suddenly stood clearly on the page, and to him it seemed as if the letters were writ out in blood. 582. Bel homme, Louise, aged sixty, discharged. And just below the other entry. 583. Lange, Jeanne, aged twenty, actress, square du Roule, number five, suspected of harbouring traitors and ci devant, transferred twenty-ninth niveaux to the temple, cell twenty-nine. He saw nothing more, for suddenly it seemed to him as if someone held a vivid scarlet veil in front of his eyes, whilst a hundred claw-like hands were tearing at his heart and at his throat. "'Clear out now! It is my turn, what? Are you going to stand there all night?' A rough voice seemed to be speaking these words. Rough hands, apparently, were pushing him out of the way, and someone snatched the candle out of his hand. But nothing was real. He stumbled over a corner of a loose flagstone, and would have fallen, but something seemed to catch hold of him, and to lead him away for a little distance, until a breath of cold air blew upon his face. This brought him back to his senses. Jeanne was a prisoner in the temple. Then his place was in the prison of the temple, too. It could not be very difficult to run one's head into the noose that caught so many necks these days. A few cries of Vive le Roi, or A bas la République, and more than one prison door would gape invitingly to receive another guest. The hot blood had rushed into Armand's head. He did not see clearly before him, nor did he hear distinctly. There was a buzzing in his ears, as of myriads of mocking birds' wings, and there was a veil in front of his eyes— a veil through which he saw faces and forms flitting ghost-like in the gloom, men and women jostling or being jostled, soldiers, sentinels, then long interminable corridors, more crowd and more soldiers, winding stairs, courtyards and gates, finally the open street, the quay and the river beyond. An incessant hammering went on in his temples, and that veil never lifted from before his eyes. Now it was lurid and red, as if stained with blood. Anon it was white, like a shroud, but it was always there. Through it he saw the Pont au Change, which he crossed, then far down on the Quai de l'École, to the left the corner house behind saint germain l'Auxrois, where Blakeney lodged. Blakeney, who for the sake of a stranger had forgotten all about his comrade and Jeanne. Through it he saw the network of streets which separated him from the neighbourhood of the temple, the gardens of ruined habitations, the closely shuttered and barred windows of ducal houses, then the mean streets, the crowded drinking-bars, the tumble-down shops with their dilapidated awnings. He saw with eyes that did not see, heard the tumult of daily life round him with ears that did not hear. Jeanne was in the temple prison, and when its grim gates closed finally for the night, he, Armand, her chevalier, her lover, her defender, would be within its walls, as near to cell number twenty-nine as bribery and treaty, promises, would help him to attain. Ah! There at last loomed the great building, the pointed bastions cut through the surrounding gloom as with a sable knife. Armand reached the gate. The sentinels challenged him. He replied, "'Vive le roi!' shouting wildly like one who is drunk. 
He was hatless, and his clothes were saturated with moisture. He tried to pass, but crossed bayonets barred the way. Still he shouted, Vive le roi! and A bas la république! Allons, the fellow is drunk, said one of the soldiers. Armand fought like a madman. He wanted to reach that gate. He shouted, he laughed, and he cried, until one of the soldiers, in a fit of rage, struck him heavily on the head. Armand fell backwards, stunned by the blow. His foot slipped on the wet pavement. Was he indeed drunk, or was he dreaming? He put his hand up to his forehead. It was wet, but whether with the rain or with blood he did not know. But for the space of one second he tried to collect his scattered wits. "'Citizen Saint-Just,' said a quiet voice at his elbow. Then, as he looked round, dazed, feeling a firm, pleasant grip on his arm, the same quiet voice continued calmly, "'Perhaps you do not remember me, Citizen Saint-Just. I had not the honour of the same close friendship with you as I had with your charming sister. My name is Chauvelin. Can I be of any service to you?' End of chapter 16